Hello and welcome to Real Sports Overtime. I'm Brian Gumbel sitting here with our newest correspondent, Carl Quintanilla. We're talking about Carl's piece on fantasy leagues and how lucrative they've become. How did these things get started? Uh, about five years ago, some of these sites started cropping up. The technology was there, the internet was there, major ball clubs were online, where you could tech easily redo your draft on a daily basis. Uh, it's taken a while for the money to start flowing in and for the marketing to bring players to the game. But now it's easy for you to have a lineup on Monday, have a completely new slate of players on Tuesday. So let's say I wanted to join one of these sites. And I'm not trying to give anybody any how-to ideas, but let's say I wanted to join one of these sites. Do I have to sign up? Do I have to establish a credit line? Do I have to give them all of my background? Do they require a resume? What, what's... You know, we went on a bunch of sites, and there you do have to put a credit card down. Uh, they maybe they take PayPal. They might even ask you to send in a picture of your photo ID. But other than that, there's very Is little. Is there a ceiling on how nope. much they can pull nope. out of there's, my credit card once they've got it? The industry says we self-regulate, meaning there's no overarching yeah, regulation. Right. I read that. I heard but, that. But in other words, there's, uh, there's a tournament where the prizes are set in advance. But if we go head-to-head, -head, for instance, theoretically, there's no limit what we could bet. But, but let's say I give them my card. What's to stop them from taking more than I want them to take? Uh, well, you're authorizing a certain amount. So I have to authorize it each each time I make a play? Absolutely. Each time I submit a lineup? Each time I buy a player or what? Each, uh, I, I guess each time you play a game, there's a fee. There's an entry fee. T 25 bucks, 100 bucks, 250 bucks. And it gets charged just like you would be paying for dinner at a restaurant. How many of these sites are there? That's a really tough one to answer because there's no, because there's no regulation, you and I could start our own fantasy site today. And it, who, who knows, who would know about it unless we advertised it well enough. So, so we see the best players like the Corey Albertsons are getting rich off of this. Are the sites getting rich? Sites take 10% and they're giving away a large a portion of the money they take in, right? They're basically a funnel for this cash. Take in the entry fee, give a lot of it away in the way of winnings and take that cut. So in the competition between site A and site Z, what determines who's the winner in terms of, of who is the more successful site? Well, the volume. What determines who makes the most profit? Well, that's, that's the whole argument behind why the marketing is such a fierce battle. FanDuel has is, is just got to deal with the Orlando Magic. You will see the FanDuel logo in the paint on the Magic Court. And that's something they now have up on DraftKings, which is the other large player in this space. So they're, they're trying to get the, the most number of players they can in a hurry, and then hopefully get those players to invest the biggest fees they can. Mm -hmm. You talked about the, the and, and the guy in there said, we're left to self-regulation. there any evidence at all that they are self-regulating? Well, their argument would be, look, if we start allowing bad actors to come in, right, and providing the environment for... Who would be a bad actor? Well, Why would somebody be a bad actor in this? Let's there? say you and I started uh, our own site and we let we didn't d do background checks, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they would argue that's bad for the industry as a whole. That's going to draw the eyes of regulators. It's going to create potential challenges in court. So their argument is it's in our best interest if we all have some reasonable expectation of what should be allowed. Mm -hmm. Are the leagues involved in this? And I'm talking about MLB, NBA, NFL. Are they complicit in this? I think absolutely. I mean, you've got, they're, look, they're investing money on the league level, on the club level, the networks are investing. You've got huge pockets of lobbying power and cash interested in making this thing work. And I think that's why it's taken so long to catch fire. Because in the early days, who knew if this was going to be a long-standing business from the legal point of view? But I think enough general counsel's office have taken a look at it recommended to the CEO, we think this is gonna stand, let's start putting our toe in. Yeah, I can remember years ago, I think it was probably like maybe 1983, I played in the first rotisserie league for baseball. And I think it was for five bucks and that was it. How'd you do? Lousy. <laughs> Carl, thank you. It's really great to have you with us. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us on Real Sports Overtime. Remember, you can catch a new episode of Real Sports every month right here on HBO.